thought of was renovation and innovation, which I think is what we're really seeing this year um, in, in the consumer electronics world, which is how we've seen a lot of the industry drivers from the past 10 years, like flat panel TV, really reach maturity and, and indeed the replacement cycle and things like that tailing off in those markets. Um, and, and, and thinking about new ways to reinvent those products um, and bring them back to the front, back to consumers' attention. Um, and, and of course, at the other extreme, we have new products that are very, very immature um, that possibly will be the hit products of two, three, five years' time. Uh, and, and as I prepared it, I thought about the uh, uh, Jeffrey Moore's book, Inside the Tornado, and I think it's quite important to realize that you know, products have a life cycle. Uh, and what we're seeing at the moment with flat panel TV is a lot of industry consolidation. You know, most people know how to make a really good flat panel TV, and the differentiation is in the industrial structure and in marketing. Um, the other warning that we started to see, of course, is that the, uh, the really boom days of the smartphone business are probably behind us. Um, and while smartphone penetration is still globally relatively low, all the new smartphones are going to be at much, much cheaper prices and the, you know, the big profits have been made. And again, we're probably entering a period of consolidation. And then at the very, very other extreme, just about to appear these little tiny green shoots from seeds of the wearables market, um, which is going to grow. There'll be lots and lots of companies in it. I think uh, last week I, I tracked 79 companies making wearable products. Um, that's definitely uh, not including all the people in China. Um, and there's going to be a whole load more. Uh, and, and we'll see that. Uh, that boom, and then we'll see consolidation. Uh, and, and this is in the natural order of things. So on to renovation. Um, and the first one, I, I think, strategically is to do something different. And, and here's Curve TV. Uh, it's quite a controversial feature, and um, it, it's one of those things that, in a mature category, you've got to do something different and create new sources of value. And one of those is styling. And uh, some people love curved TV, some people hate it. That's absolutely fine. Yeah? If somebody loves it, they'll pay a bit extra. Yeah? And what we see going on in, with curved TV is it's a way to add a premium to that. And while it may not take over the world, then at the same time, if it improves people's business and they end up with more money on the bottom line, what's not to like? And then something else will come on in the high end. So our view is that it will peak probably in 2016, stay really at the high end, and have only a few brands will use it to market their products distinctively, and then it will slowly tail off. Um, and that's fine. And I've got some forecasts there. So we think that probably just under a million will, uh, will ship this year. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a few more um, product launches a bit later in the year from brands as they adjust their product ranges this year. Um, but that's, that's where we are. On to 4K, then I think to sum it up is that 4K TVs have escaped into the wild. Uh, there's been a lot of publicity noise from, from Netflix now, so we've seen the products. We're now seeing the services beginning to appear. But the big fear from most broadcasters is that actually current 4K TV is really not quite good enough that consumers really don't see enough of a difference. And I thought I'd, I'd explore a little bit why. Um, and essentially that what broadcasters have and where we are at the moment is UHD zero. Um, and what broadcasters really want to do is something more like UHD1, probably in Europe and North America, or indeed in Japan, then NHK in particular is saying, no, let's wait and let the technology catch up and then do it really, really well. Yeah? And, and do something that will last maybe a generation. Um, with that is our shipment forecast. This is really unchanged in terms of its general shape from last year that half the TVs, at least in 4K, are going to be shipped in China. Um, and that's back to the difference in strategies that I outlined then. It hasn't changed that in China it's going to be a small premium um, and some extra pixels, whereas everywhere else people are trying to build this as a next generation of TV. And what the broadcasters are most worried about is 
making sure that the next generation is worth investing in, that it is sufficiently different from where we are today with 1080p. And the big fear that broadcasters have is that when you do comparison tests, then 1080p at uh, 120 hertz looks better to consumers than 4K at 60 hertz. Okay? There isn't enough clear water between them. Uh, and what they want to do is do things like the frame rate and the color um, and the dynamic range, so the difference between bright, bright areas and dark areas, to actually really make it a completely different experience. The other thing is also that we're seeing some change in, uh, in, in, in the idea of how you present 4K content. And um, I think the leader on this is Sky Deutschland. They're really saying, okay, we've got all these pixels. Well, you could just have a super detailed picture, but you could do something else with it. And what you can see here, and they, they showed this at, uh, at IFA last year, um, was you can have, you can watch a game, you can have the best seat in the stadium, understand all the context, and at the same time get the conventional director's cut of it where the action follows the ball and the players, and also you can watch replays and things like that without breaking into the action, which is always a problem in a game like football, where if you want to show an action replay, you may miss something. And of course, then you have to replay that other bit that got missed and, and the director is tearing his hair out that he's getting further and further away from the action. So I think it's an interesting way of doing things that you can do something really different, much more like what you'd actually do in a stadium where you focus your attention sometimes on the players and sometimes on the bigger picture. The other thing that's definitely clear is that higher frame rates are necessary. Consumers' experience with the best displays is probably that three, four, five inch display in your pocket. That the level of resolution, uh, the fact that it's pin sharp, the fact that the colors are incredibly saturated means that probably now your best experience is mobile. And that if you've got $249 or um, 249 euros, then go out and have a look at what you get, which is a very low end 32 inch TV entry level one, but from a good brand, or you can have a tablet. Um, and my experience now is when, when taking a tablet, I prefer to watch video in a hotel on the tablet on my knees rather than on the TV on the other side of the room. Um, you know, the tablets really are coming on and they're really setting the expectations. So in, in summary, I had great fun with this slide. What can we learn from 3D? And, and you know, 3D was dead before dawn. Um, and, and why was 3D dead before dawn? And that's because of the experience. Yeah? What you are trying to do with presenting something on TV is that suspension of disbelief, that immersion, that perception that it's real. And if you do it really right, then something goes in that little monkey brain that we've got up here, and it, and it says that's real. And you just go, wow. Yeah? And you know it when you see it. And the problem with 3D was that in the rush to launch it quickly, and the rush to bring down the price, and in the rush to make more, then it ended up as a worse experience than, than HD. And as a result, consumers saw through it. You know, consumers are actually quite smart. You know, they, they may not know why they don't like it, but they just go, yeah. and that's what happened. And you know, we're living with the aftermath of, yeah. It, it was poor value. And so on to wearables. Um, this is a really different market, and I started mouthing off to my managing director late last year that we weren't doing enough on wearables, and uh, here I am talking about them. Um, in consumer electronics, you know, SKU's diversity is death. How many brands um, have more than 60 TVs in Europe? In, in their model range is very, very few. Okay? Amazon in the US has 300,000 SKUs of watches. It's a really different combination. It's about the color and the strap, and you can find that you can get the numerals. Some are Roman, some are Arabic, some are bars, and then you've got date and day and date, and one's in gold and one's in silver and one's in platinum. It's so diverse, and they're all different shapes and sizes. And they all do the same thing, which is tell the time. And you can spend from 15 euros for a Casio, which tells the time perfectly, up to 80,000 euros for something made by one guy in the shed in Switzerland. 
But, you know, it's so different. And I think one of the things that we will watch really interesting, with great interest, is how this fashion market develops. But we've actually seen it already, and it's happened in phones, where people put it on them and it, and it becomes part of their identity, and they really see their phone as part of their identity. So there's been this huge flowering of accessories. Yeah, ten years ago, you bought your Nokia Kalashnikov phone, and it was you, had, you could get a you get a holster for it to put on your belt, and it was black, and that was it. And then they made one for women that was pink. And, and and how different is this? And this is where the wearable market is going to be so different that you have to start thinking about that personalisation. The other thing that we have to be careful of is the moment we put it on you, it's fashionable and fashion fades. How many people in here wear a Bluetooth headset in public nowadays? Yeah, it says, when I see somebody with a Bluetooth headset nowadays, it doesn't mean that he's driving a 5 Series BMW. Yeah, he drives a Mercedes van with DHL painted on the side of it. Yeah? So how something has gone from being really high-end 10 years ago to just an entry-level product and only there because your employer tells you you've got to wear it to be safe. I then started looking at some other things, which is uh, healthy lifestyles, um, and also talking to some fitness device makers, and they really see the demand is the same everywhere. Be it in China or Germany or the US, it's the same everywhere, which is that people are concerned about their fitness um, and their health. 